So, Western Conference trade ideas for the good teams. How many good teams are there in the West? Probably like six right now. There are six teams over 500. Maybe we'll just go by that criteria. And it's funny to start with the Lakers because I don't know if they can really do anything. Their best bet of making a move would be KCP declining his no trade clause. Yes, he has a no trade clause because of extension rules or whatever. And as a result, it makes it pretty tough to move him. I mean, if it's not him, you're putting together Quinn Cook and JaVale McGee salaries, and that gets you to about $7 million, but none of the Lakers' picks are that great. Uh, maybe they can move one of them within all those protected Pelicans picks. I don't really know. But it just doesn't look like they have a lot of ammo to really make a move. If we move on to the Clippers, they of course have quite a few draft picks going to the Thunder. But they do have their pick this season, which they can trade. They also have quite a few of their own second rounders that they can trade. And their salary filler is not horrible. Between uh, Rodney Magruder, Jerome Robinson, Patrick Patterson. It's not a lot, but it's more than nothing. However, I don't think these guys have a real weakness right now. Harkless has been good. Jamichael Green has been kind of really good. His shooting has been pretty damn legit for them. So... I don't totally know. I mean, maybe you just want to get a more consistent shooter. Even then, Shamit just came back, so in a way, that's your guy anyway. I don't know, man. The Clippers' depth is pretty wild, so I can't find an obvious move for them. If we move on to Dallas. So the interesting thing to me for the Mavs is if they were going to trade Courtney Lee as expiring and some picks because they got some seconds they can't move this year's first because it's going to the Knicks next year but if they wanted to trade Courtney Lee's contract would they take back someone who has a lot of years left because if they don't do anything too crazy in terms of acquiring long-term contracts they can be free agent players in 2022 but like, what do we think they're going to do there? Are they going to stand packed? Are they just going to get a little more aggressive? Do they even have the assets to get more aggressive? I don't know. It's it's an interesting thing. But if they were content with taking on a longer salary guy, is Dallas an Aaron Gordon potential team? I mean, the Courtney Lee contract could help you with that. You know, potentially. I mean, we don't know what Orlando really wants to do with that. I mean, really what the Mavs need is, to me, is just like a really, really good uh, off-the-ball dude who can also create his own offense. And, you know, it, it turns out it's kind of difficult to get one of those guys on your team unless you're giving up a lot of stuff. And they don't have a super lot of things to give up at this point. I think once we get a little closer to uh, the mid-2020s, I think we could see Dallas pull off another big trade or we, again, we could just see them be players in free agency in a couple of seasons, so, yeah. If we can move on to Denver, the big thing with them is just Jokic getting back to being really, really great. And they're going to need Jamal Murray to uh, become a second star eventually. He's still averaging, he's actually averaging 17 a game right now and some pretty rough efficiency, so not the season they would like him to have so far. I mean, really, they just need a second star player and Jokic to get his act together. So, I kind of think of that more so than, oh, they could get like a, a shooter, or they could get like another good defensive wing or whatever. Well, I do want to mention, Jokic has been better the last about six games or so. So, there's a chance he's already back to being that guy, and we're just seeing the beginning of it now. So, to be honest, I really don't know, dude. I mean... What type of move do you make when you just need your two best players to be really good? You get better top two players. Well, you're not getting anybody better than Jokic. And as of right now, you're not getting anybody better than Jamal Murray. Unless some star player requests a trade in, you know, the next week or so. So, um, I really don't know. I mean, I've seen Paul Millsap for Kevin Love. I don't agree with it at all. I think Millsap, for one, is just better. Two, it, it, I've seen the rationale. Well, they're good defensively, so you get Kevin Love. Well, part of the reason they're good defensively is because of Paul Millsap. So, no. 
And now we move on to actually my motivation for doing these uh, East and West trade videos. The Houston Rockets, who apparently tried to do like a four-team trade to get Andre Iguodala, and it's not going to happen. What does Houston need? We all know what they need. They need another wing who can do wing things. 3 and D, the, you know, we all know what, it, what I'm trying to say here. But I don't really know where a move comes from. I mean, you can't trade Gordon for, I think it's like six months because of his extension, so it's pretty much got to be Capella on the move, unless there's a cheap wing out there, or Daryl Morey pulls off the most miraculous move full of just guys making $2 million ever. You just have to be taking back some center who doesn't suck pretty much, because, I mean, I've said this before, the idea is Capella always gets worse in the playoffs, he's not a good enough offensive player, to make teams pay for daring him to do stuff and things like that, right? And if you start going nuts with the three-team trades and potentially even four-team trades, there is a world in which Capella moves somewhere and the Rockets are getting back a big who doesn't suck and then one wing player who can do some things for you. As far as where that is, uh, don't ask me to figure it out at this very moment because I cannot. Although I guess I can look and see which teams could use a long-term center. If you were going to trade for Capella, that's what you're hoping for. I mean, I'm sure the Celtics would like to have him. I would assume that the Hornets would maybe. They were already rumored for Drummond. I mean, to me, Capella might be better than Drummond or a little worse or whatever. But he's, get, he's going to get paid a lot less, so there's that. Yeah, I don't know. Those are like the two good teams. Well, Hornets, good. Whatever you would consider good. And in the West, I mean, the Warriors would love to have him. I'm sure the Spurs would love to have Capella. So, you know, there's, there's a couple teams who could use him. And if you could have one of those teams and then another team and you start throwing weird three-team trade ideas around, you might be able to come to something. And I'm sure Daryl Morey has proposed all sort of weird things. Now, if the NBA had allowed them to use Nene's incentive-based contract as salary filler, then they'd be looking a lot prettier, but unfortunately his contract is only worth $2 million, even if through incentives it could be as high as like $10 million or whatever. There's a whole thing. You can Google it. It totally passed me by. Um, now we can move on to the Utah Jazz. I did mention in some video the idea of Dante Exum on the move. I mean, this team is is all in for right now, you know? And I just don't think they have a lot more time to just give to Dante Exum and hope that he's good. And he is making nine and a half million. And I'm stealing this one from Zach Lowe where he said that they could trade him. And I think it's Tony, Tony Bradley for Marcus Morris, but I'm pretty sure the money doesn't totally match up there. But Zach Lowe said it, so I'm going to trust that it's true in some way, whether it's throwing another player in there or whatever. I think it's that kind of idea for the Jazz. Another offensive option who can just give you some minutes and make some shots. Doesn't necessarily have to be Marcus Morris. And to state the obvious, the Jazz are probably including one of their seconds between 2022 and 2024. They actually have quite a few seconds in that little span of time. Their firsts are all weird because of the Conley trade, so... Yeah, but they, they, they got a little bit of stuff. This one probably terrifies Jazz fans. But what about Jordan Clarkson, who's been kind of not horrible? It's an idea, you know. He hasn't been very good throughout his career, but if you put him in Quinn Snyder's system, maybe it could be okay. Even as I say that, I'm kind of not believing the things I'm saying, but, you know, it's something. Anyway, after that, are we getting to the teams below 500 in the West? I believe we are. So I guess I can spitball real quick. For the Kings, I think it's mainly health. I think OKC is building for the future, even if that means this season they remain kind of decent. For Phoenix, I think a lot of it is just getting Aiton back and seeing between Mikhail Bridges, Cam Johnson, all these guys who's actually good. But maybe they could go for some sort of two-way wings to shore up their defense a little bit. The T-Wolves have lost seven in a row. The Jeff T contract is there. I mean... I don't know, sometimes I think they should just get a little more aggressive with moves and go for a couple of win-right-now guys. Not like 30-year-olds, but 25-year-olds or whatever. 
Unfortunately, they shouldn't be trading any of their own firsts, so I don't know, maybe you lottery protected first in a couple of seconds, and you give up on some random young player who's whatever for you. I don't know. I don't really think they should do that, but sometimes I think they should. So, yeah. We'll see what happens. Hopefully it's a fun trade season. I hope, like, dudes actually get moved. I don't want there to be nothing happening, so... That's it.